Good afternoon. My name is Alan Friesen, YouTube channel Alan the Friesen. Welcome to English 30-2, where we will be talking about Ellie Wiesel's Night. <laughs> Apparently nobody's going to clap. That's okay with me. Oh, oh, oh. Ellie Wiesel. Now, if I've pronounced this incorrectly, I do apologize. I've looked it up. I've checked my sources. I'm fairly sure that's how to pronounce it. As well as the main character in the book, who is known as Eliezer. If I'm wrong, please, please forgive me. Today we're going to be talking about three themes in night. We're going to be looking at the relationship between fathers and sons. We're going to be looking at aloneness. And we're going to be looking at hope in the death of God. Now I'm going to be reading some passages from night in order to discuss these three themes. The version of Night that I'm drawing this from is the Oprah's Club version. This is the most recent up-to-date version that's available in English. So if you have this version online or whatever and you want to look up what I'm talking about, that's the version I'm using. So because I'm also teaching this class as the, at the same time as I'm delivering this YouTube lecture, I'm bringing my class into it a little bit by, by talking a little bit about what we did yesterday in class. So yesterday in class, we went through a chronology of the Holocaust. And in order to make some sense of what happened during the Holocaust, we, I asked the students to look at certain patterns. So some of the patterns we came up with were war, collaboration, uh, we looked at death. And what I asked them to do as they read it was to do some fun little symbols, where's my pen, in order to denote each of these things. So death was a cross. And freedom, the loss of freedom, or the gaining of freedom, was a little square. And circle for a law, something to do with the legal system. So what I've done is, when I went through the book, I pulled out about six pages of important quotes that I thought really explained the book quite well and were really important in terms of what we find in the novel. And what I did then is I looked at these three, these quotes, and I organized them according to these three different themes. So, relationship between fathers and sons, aloneness and hope, and the death of God. As I went through this handout that I gave to my students, what I did was on the side, I put F, A, or R. So, fathers, aloneness, or religion. So, when I talk about this, and as you're watching online, you're thinking, what is this guy doing? What I'm doing is I'm giving my students this key so that when they're going through their notes, they can also write this down, F, oh, fathers, or A, oh, aloneness. It's a studying guide, but it's also a way of, of correlating data. And it's an important skill for us to learn. So, let us begin. It's important to know, at the very beginning of the book, the story of the binding of Isaac. Now, I went through this yesterday in my class, and I'm not going to go through it again today. This is the story of Abraham and Isaac when Abraham is asked to sacrifice his son Isaac. At the last second, an angel says, whoa, you don't have to do that, it's okay. Because you were faithful and because you were willing to do this, I'm going to make your descendants as numerous as the stars. I'm going to bless you, Abraham, as a result. This story is important, and we're going to see why once we get towards the end of this lecture. If you have not read this story, uh, you can go online and just Google Genesis 22, and the very first 20 verses is where the story is from. It'll be the first result. It'll be really easy for you to find. So the first, the first topic that I want to look at is the idea of the relationship between fathers and sons. Now, for those of you in my class, number two is the first quotation that deals with it. This is from page 11 in the book. So the, um, the father Shlomo is saying to his son, the yellow star, so what? It's not lethal. And then the narrator says, poor father, of what then did you die? A little bit of context here. This is at the very beginning of the book when all of these rules and restrictions were being placed in the, uh, on the Jewish people in, um, in Transylvania, where, um, where Eliezer grew up. And the father is saying, well, it's just a yellow star. That doesn't really matter that much. And you know, to a certain extent, sure, it, it wouldn't matter. If, if, if we were putting ourselves into that situation, and we as Canadians were told, you have to wear a maple leaf in order to identify that you're Canadian. Mary Butler, please come to the office. Mary Butler. 
Awesome. I'm really glad that you on the internet could hear that very important announcement. Thank you. Let's keep going. If Canadians were asked to put a maple leaf on their shirt to get it, uh, to get it sewn on, we might think to ourselves, okay, that's not such a big deal. But then if Canadians were identified, were put into concentration camps, and were killed, then that yellow star, or in our case, the, um, the maple leaf, has a different meaning for us. So at this point in the novel, when Shlomo's talking about the yellow star, it doesn't matter, because it's just a piece of cloth. Through the lens of history, we look back at this yellow star, and we see what it means. We see that it represents something. But for our purposes, when we're talking about the relationship between fathers and sons, we've got, we've got Eliezer saying, poor father, of what then did you die? He's spoiling the ending for us. He's letting us know that his father is going to die. Why? Why is he doing this? And why is he saying, poor father? So, and he's, he, that's like, he's, he's basically saying, well, father, if it wasn't really that harmful, or if it wasn't really that effective, then, you know, how did you die? He's implicitly criticizing his father. And it's a gentle criticism. It's, it's tinged with regret. Poor father. But what he's saying is, is that you died as a result of this father. And at this very early point in the book, you don't really know what's to come. And Eliezer, as the narrator, having gone through this, knows what's to come. So we have a little bit of foreshadowing here. But we also see that the relationship between father and son is more complex than we might first imagine. He's pitying his dead father. He's not lamenting his death. He's pitying him, which is an entirely different prospect. There's a, there's a French critic, and I forget the name now, of course, I forget the name, who said that the relationship between Eliezer and his father was fairly juvenile. If you've got a 15-year-old boy who wants to hold his father's hand, you know, that seems very juvenile, doesn't it? But I and other critics would argue that no, their relationship wasn't so much about a father looking after his son. It was the idea of interdependency. These two people were dependent upon each other for survival. And so, because they were dependent on each other, one could almost say that they had an almost equal relationship. <coughs> you pity somebody you could pity somebody who I suppose is your son and all that, but you feel bad for them. You feel, you feel terrible, but pity is a different emotion. And I understand that this is a translation, and we shouldn't be reading too much into specific words. But just keep in mind the idea of interdependency, and keep in mind the idea of equality between father and son. So then we're going to move to 30, page 33, 30-2, so this is number 5. So this is as they're marching on their way to the first camp. We continued our march. We were coming closer and closer to the pit, from which an infernal heat was rising. Twenty more steps. If I was going to kill myself, this was the time. Our column had only some fifteen steps to go. I bit my lips so that my father would not hear my teeth chattering. Ten more steps. Eight. Seven. We were walking slowly as one follows a hearse. Our own funeral procession. Only four more steps. Three. There it was now, very close to us, the pit and its flames. I gathered all that remained of my strength in order to break rank and throw myself onto the barbed wire. Deep down, I was saying goodbye to my father, to the whole universe, and against my will, I found myself whispering the words, and I apologize, this is not going to sound right. Yizgadol, Ve'ezgadish, Shemiraba, may his name be exalted and sanctified. My heart was about to burst. There, I was face to face with the angel of death. No, two steps from the pit, we were ordered to turn left and herded into barracks. I squeezed my father's hand. So at this point, this is the, this is the criticism, the idea that, that he's being seen as, as, a, as a juvenile character. But I would argue that it's something more than that. You've got this child this man child, you've got this adolescent who's thinking about killing himself because he's entering, he's in this terrible place. He decides not to. He's not, I don't think he's reaching out his hand to his father for comfort. I think it's more about the idea of human contact. He was on the brink of death. He's on the brink of killing himself. And in order to 
feel human, in order to, to be pulled back from that break, he needed the touch of another person, the person who was closest to him, and that was his father at this point. Right after that, we have the line, he said, do you remember Mrs. Shatter in the train? This is a reference to the woman on the train who's screaming, my God, everything's burning, everything's on fire. This idea of, of prophecy. She saw somehow what was happening in these camps. She saw the death, even though people thought that she was a mad woman. She, they thought she was crazy. But the idea of memory is very important in this book, and we'll come back to that when we talk a little bit later. If you go on to the next page, 30 Dash Shoes, uh, for the rest of us, we're on page 39. This is when they had reached the first barracks. My father suddenly had a colic attack. He got up and politely asked in German, excuse me, could you tell me where the toilets are located? The gypsy, who's the captain? This is the man that's going to be in charge of the barracks. The gypsy stared at him for a long time, from head to toe, as if he wished to ascertain that the person addressing him was actually a creature of flesh and bone, a human being with a body and a belly. Then as if waking from a deep sleep, he slapped my father with such force that he fell down and then crawled back to his place on all fours. I stood petrified. What had happened to me? My father had just been struck in front of me, and I had not even blinked. I had watched and kept silent. Only yesterday I would have dug my nails into this criminal's flesh. Had I changed this that much, so fast? Remorse began to gnaw at me. All I could think was, I shall never forgive them for this. My father must have guessed my thoughts, because he whispered in my ear, it doesn't hurt. His cheek still bore the red mark of the hand. This passage is important because it's the first time that we see Eliezer begin to distance himself from his father. And the narrator, the, the narrator Eliezer, notes this. Yesterday he would have dug at the flesh of the criminal, but today he did nothing. He's talking about the idea that the camps change people. Whereas before he would have defended his father, he would have come to his father's aid. Now, he's concerned about his own survival. And because he's concerned about that, he doesn't immediately rush out to his father's defense. And this is going to be a theme that we see throughout the rest of the book. We see this tension in Eliezer between protecting his father, looking out for him, but also the resentment that he feels for doing so. So let's move on. Uh, at the bottom of the second page for us, it's page 48, number 9. One of the tent leader's aides, a tough-looking boy with shifty eyes, came over to me. Would you like to get into a good commando? Of course, but on one condition. I want to stay with my father. All right, he said. I can arrange it. For a pittance. Your shoes. I'll give you another pair. I refused to give him my shoes. They were all I had left. I'll also give you a ration of bread with some margarine. He liked my shoes. I would not let them have them. Later, they were taken from me anyway, in exchange for nothing at that time. So the only reason I mention this is because at this point, Eliezer has the, um, has the option to be put into a commando, into a working group, with his father. All it'll cost him is his shoes. And he decides not to sacrifice his shoes, not to give them away for that chance to be with his father. As it turns out, he's placed with his father anyway, and that works out. And also, as it turns out, his shoes get stolen from him. So in a sense, if he had sacrificed his shoes at this point, it would have been a meaningless sacrifice. But for our purposes, he was not willing to give it up. He was not willing to do that for his father. As I talked about, we see this recurring theme running throughout the text. If you go on to the next page, this is on page 54, number 10 for the rest of us. Another time we were loading diesel motors onto freight cars under the supervision of some German soldiers. Idek was on edge. He had trouble restraining himself. Suddenly he exploded. The victim this time was my father. You old loafer, he started yelling. Is this what you call working? And he began beating him with an iron bar. At first, my father simply doubled over under the blows. But then he seemed to break in two like an old tree struck by lightning. I had watched it all happening without moving. I kept silent. In fact, I thought of stealing away in order not to suffer the blows. 
What's more, if I felt anger at that moment, it was not directed at the capital, but at my father. Why couldn't he have avoided its wrath? That was what life in a concentration camp had made me. Now notice, again, he feels rage towards his father for making himself a target, as opposed to feeling bad for his father, who's going to be beaten. This very clearly foreshadows the death of Shlomo at the end, when he is beaten to death by an SS officer, and Eliezer doesn't do anything. Like I said, this pattern, we see it again and again. And if we go to the next page, so this is page 75 for us. This is as, um, as the father is getting sicker and sicker, he's no longer feeling like he's able to move, for our YouTube folks, this is page 75. He felt time was running out. He was speaking rapidly. He wanted to tell me so many things. His speech became confused. His voice was choked. He knew that I had to leave in a few moments. He was going to remain alone, so alone. Here, take this knife, he said. I won't need it anymore. You may find it useful. Also take this spoon. Don't sell it. Quickly, go ahead. Take what I'm giving you. My inheritance. Don't talk like that, Father. I was on the verge of breaking into sobs. I don't want you to say such things. Keep the spoon and knife. You will need them as much as I. We'll see each other tonight after work. He looked at me with his tired eyes, veiled by despair. He insisted, I am asking you, take it. Do as I ask you, my son. Time is running out. Do as your father asks you. Our capo shouted the order to march. So. At this point, we're seeing Eliezer's ambivalence towards his father. Before, we saw him getting angry. He was getting beaten, and it was his father's fault. But here, with his father on the verge of death, he feels bad. He doesn't want him to die. But on the other hand, he knows that he could, he knows that he could take these things, and he could use them. Then on page 87, this is during the forced march after Eliezer's operation. My father's presence was the only thing that stopped me. He was running next to me, out of breath, out of strength, desperate. I had no right to let myself die. What would he do without me? I was his sole support. This is pages 86 to 87. And see again the ambivalence. He doesn't want him to die. He was the only person that was keeping him alive. Later on, on page 91, he says, and then this is, this is in reference to the rabbi's son, who had left his father. So at this point, Eliezer prays, O oh God, master of the universe, give me strength never to do what Rabbi Eliyahu's son has done. And then later on, on page 107, he was lying on the boards, ashen, his lips pale and dry, shivering. I couldn't stay with him any longer. We had been ordered to go outside to allow for cleaning of the blocks. Only the sick could remain inside. We stayed outside for five hours. We were given soup. When they allowed us to return to the blocks, I rushed toward my father. Did you eat? No. Why? They didn't give us anything. They said that we were sick, that we would die soon, and it would be a waste of food. I can't go on. I gave him what was left of my soup, but my heart was heavy. I was aware that I was doing it grudgingly. Just like Rabbi Eliyahu said, I had not passed the test. So he had prayed, don't give me the strength to not do what this rabbi's son has done. But he's still giving the father, he's giving the food to his father, which is a good thing, but he's doing it grudgingly. We see that his own desire for survival is overcoming his filial feelings towards his father. And then finally, at the very end, this is just before the ending of the book. This is on page 111 to 112. All around me, there was silence now, broken only by moaning. In front of the block, the SS were giving orders. An officer passed between the bunks. My father was pleading. My son, water, I'm burning up, my insides. Silence over there, barked the officer. Eliezer could do my father. Water! The officer came closer and shouted to him to be silent. But my father did not hear. He continued to call me. The officer wielded his club and dealt him a violent blow to the head. 
I didn't move. I was afraid. My body was afraid of another blow, this time to my head. My father groaned once more. I heard, Eliezer. I could see that he was still breathing in gasps. I didn't move. When I came down from my bunk after roll call, I could see his lips trembling. He was murmuring something. I remained more than an hour leaning over him, looking at him, etching his bloody, broken face into my mind. Then I had to go to sleep. I climbed into my bunk above my father, who was still alive. The date was January 28, 1945. I woke up at dawn on January 29th. On my father's cough there lay another sick person. They must have taken him away before daybreak and taken him to the crematorium. Perhaps he was still breathing. No prayers were said over his tomb. No candle lit in his memory. His last word had been my name. He had called out to me and I had not answered. I did not weep and it pained me that I could not weep. But I, I was out of tears. And deep inside me, if I could have searched the recesses of my feeble conscience, I might have found something like free at last. And this is the most heartbreaking part of the book. We've got this young man who has just lost his father, and he says, I feel free because he's gone. And certainly we can understand this. If you're in a situation like this, where your very life is threatened on a daily basis, and you're being asked to take care of even your father, it, it's, it's hard to reconcile that desire to look after somebody who's part of your family with the desire to save yourself. <coughs> and at this point in the book, when he lets the SS officer beat his father almost to death and then having him die overnight, he feels like that the choice has been taken out of his own hands. He, he let it happen. And then what could he have done? He could have gotten up and he could have gotten beaten himself. The blow could have been to his head. So the relationship between father and son in this book is very complex. I mean, it's, it's made more complex by the fact that we're talking about the Holocaust. We're talking about two Jewish men in a concentration camp. But the fact of the matter is that Eliezer is not to blame for his father's death, even though we can tell in the writing that he feels a tremendous amount of guilt over it. He feels guilt for letting his father die. He grudgingly gives his father some food and he feels bad for it because he does it with a grudging heart instead of a, a, a willing heart and generous heart. And at the beginning of the book, we see that he didn't really care a lot for his father. And at the end, it's sort of the same. He, he, he cares, but he feels helpless. He feels trapped. He's not able to, to do anything to save his father's life. So this is just one of the themes that we saw in Night. In part two, we'll go over the remaining two. Just turn it off. Do, 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 do.